Good morning, Central, and welcome to our service. As we love to do here at Central, we're going to start off this morning's worship service through uh, a baptism. And uh, our candidate this morning is Joshua Thomas. And Joshua, we're so thankful that God has led you into our church family to be a member here at Central Baptist. And we're thankful, most of all, for your relationship with Jesus Christ. And now you're publicly professing him through Christian baptism. So Joshua, upon your profession of faith and in obedience to the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, I now baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, Central family. It is great to see you. An exciting day. This is my friend, Spencer Castleberry, and she has trusted Jesus Christ as her Lord. And I'm so excited when she called me to tell me that great news. And I know that she told family members that great news and that she is going to be able to share her faith with all of her friends and family. And I ask as a church family that you be praying for her. Spencer, upon your public profession and faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is my honor, my little sister, to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Love you, baby. Good morning. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand up together. The battle belongs to Him. When all you see is the battle, you see my victory. Yes. 
Amen. Give him praise. It belongs to him today. Aren't you glad Jesus loves us this morning? He's taken up that battle for us. Ladies, lead us. You may be seated. Hey, Central Baptist Church, it's Matthew West, and I'm coming to your church on March 19th. It's going to be an amazing night of ministry and worship and music at the My Story, Your Glory Tour. And I hope you and your family will join us. Tickets are on sale now at MatthewWest.com hosting Parents' Night Out on March the 10th. Parents' Night Out is exactly that, a night for you to enjoy some time together while we watch your kiddos. The cost is $5 per child, which covers a snack and activities. Sign up on the app or through a connecting point today. You can also sign up to help with child care on our app under signups. Men's Breakfast is this Saturday at 8 a.m. If you've never attended Men's Breakfast, why not start now? Come eat a good breakfast and dive into God's Word. Lead Defend is a leadership and apologetics conference for high schoolers through 25-year-olds. Each year, students gather together to dive into God's Word through dynamic speakers and powerful worship. Join us on March the 4th for only $45.
you can sign up to come with us on the app or at a connecting point. Church League softball signups have started. This year's season is from March the 27th through May the 27th. The cost is $20 per player and the deadline to sign up is today. You can sign up to play at a connecting point or attend the interest meeting following the second service. You can always use our app or handout for more information about everything that's going on at Central. Well, good morning, Central family. It is great to see you here this morning uh, as we have gathered together to do one simple but very important thing. It's the reason why we were created, and that is to worship Jesus. Um, if this is your first, con first time gathering with us to do that, uh, we are especially glad that you are here, and we would love to get to know you just a little bit better. So if you would, just fill out that Connect card there in the pew in front of you and drop it in one of the connection boxes located throughout the building. Uh, we would love to connect with you and get you connected to all that God is doing here at Central. Um, one of the things that God is doing here at Central that I and Brother Michael get the privilege uh, to witness firsthand is this, God is moving in the next generation. Uh, there have been reports of revival breaking out on college campuses all around the nation, starting in little old Wilmore, Kentucky at Asbury University and spreading around the nation with students confessing repenting, and surrendering their lives to the Lord Jesus. And that is exactly the kind of thing that our country, our nation, our world needs. Generation Z, it's the largest living generation with 72 million currently in Gen Z, and it's also the most lost generation that our country has ever seen. Uh, Gen Z can be defined as those who are currently in middle school uh, to those who have just graduated from college. So among the 72 million Gen Z, only 30% say that religion is very important to them. Only 20% uh, say that attending church is very important to them. That leaves 57 million, 600,000 Gen Z in America who could care less about religion, an even smaller number who could care less about church, an even smaller number who could care less about Christianity, and an even smaller number of followers of Jesus. And so church, that is the immense task that is before us, 57,600,000, which is why we need to be a church that loves, supports, encourages, and what I wanna call us to today is to be a church that prays fervently for the next generation. Um, there's a resource that has been designed to, to help you know how to specifically pray for Gen Z. Uh, there are these cards that are available out in the foyer um, that I want you to pick up and I want you to put it on your fridge or put it in your car, wherever you see it. So every time you open up the fridge for a late midnight snack, you see this card and you are reminded to pray for Gen Z this month. Uh, but in this moment right now, the, the graphic will be on the screen. Um, I want us to pray together as a church. I want us to pray for Gen Z to, to grow in love with Jesus and his word. I want us to pray that, that Gen Z would be able to engage with their lost friends with the gospel. We want to pray for them as they try to navigate this crazy world that we live in with the unchanging truth of God's word. We wanna pray that they might have a zeal, a passion to serve Christ as they leverage their life for his glory and his fame. Um, so you can, you can stay where you are, you can assume whatever position you're comfortable with. Uh, the graphic will be on the screen here. Um, it just matters that you pray. Uh, Brother Michael is gonna come and close us in corporate prayer in just a few minutes. But in this moment right now, church, let us pray for this generation.
Father, as we look back throughout history and see what you've done, whether it's in the Old Testament, New Testament, or the past 2,000 years of church history, the majority of the time, you have used teenagers and young adults as a catalyst for revival. We pray that you will do it again. We pray that you will do it again all over this world, and of course, we pray that you'll do it again right here in Conway, right here in Central Baptist Church. So, Lord, we pray that that Gen Z would grow deeply in love with Christ and his word. We do pray that they would engage unbelievers with the gospel as they show and share the love of Christ. We pray that they would be able to navigate this world with the truth of your word. And we pray that they would passionately serve Christ as they leverage their lives for his glory. But, Lord, we would be remiss if we prayed for them without praying for the rest of us who are of older generations because we must model these things for them. They must see in us all these things in how we love you and how we love others, how we love them, how we teach, how we preach, how we witness, how we pray, how we give, how we counsel, how we budget, how we do the simplest of things in everyday life. So Lord, as we pray for Gen Z, help us stir up within us, renew a right spirit within us, that we together may serve you more passionately and more effectively and see you be glorified in amazing ways in our midst. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. continue to worship. Oh, how he loves us, as Rebecca leads us. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun
Let's stand up together and sing that great hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Amen. What a privilege to carry all of our prayers to him this morning. Let's raise our voices.
As you can tell by the sermon bumper, we're beginning a new series this morning. I'm not sure there'll be a great deal of new information for those of you who have been raised in church, but I do know that it is meant to be a reminder of those things that we say we believe. Hoping, praying that our beliefs and our behaviors go hand in hand that what we say we believe, we practice in our everyday life. As you've already heard in the service, our emphasis today is upon prayer, and so we begin there today. What we should know, we should know that prayer is vital, that it's necessary for the New Testament church and for members of that church to prosper in their Christian lives. I'm reading from Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 12. And yes, there are dozens of other passages that I could have chosen. I chose this passage because it's somewhat unusual and will help me to make a point that I think we need to learn about. I could have talked about the model prayer where Jesus said, Pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I could have talked about the high priestly prayer from John 17 where Jesus taught us to pray for unity and to love one another and gave us that commandment that loving one another would prove to the world that we were his. I could talk about the Sermon on the Mount where he said, whatever you ask as you seek and knock, you will be given. I could have talked about the book of Acts where a dozen times or more it says where they were devoted to prayer. And one particular says, as they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Or several occasions when Paul said, you pray without ceasing. This is God's will for your life. Put on the whole armor of God and let all of your praying be done in the Spirit. Or I could have turned to James and heard James as he cried out and said that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man would avail much. But this is a New Testament encounter with Jesus in the temple. It's the Passion Week. He entered Jerusalem triumphantly on Sunday. They threw their cloaks and their palm branches down before him and cried, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Here comes the King. And now just a couple of days later, Chapter 21 and verse 12. Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But... You made it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read that out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So somewhere about Tuesday or Wednesday of the Passion Week, Jesus is ministering in the temple. Blind folk are coming to him, and he's touching eyes, and they leave saying that he caused me to see. Lame people are coming to him, and he's touching the wounded and the afflicted, and they are hopping away with joy that they've come into the presence of Jesus Christ. But then he turns, and there is a table. And behind that table, there are swindlers who are cheating people out of their sacrificial offerings. Here's what happened. They sold doves and pigeons to those who could not afford to bring them with them as they traveled to come for Passover. They'd sell this dove or this pigeon to you. But instead of sacrificing it for you, they'd sell it to you also. 
And instead of sacrificing it for you, they'd sell it again and again, making much and giving little. And Jesus declared, my house is meant to be a house of prayer. But you, by the action and attitude that you've shown, you've made it a den of thieves. So I want to talk to you this morning about the price that we pay when we do not pray. And I want to talk about the priority that prayer really does need to have in our lives. And maybe just a word about the purpose of prayer, what it does for us, in us, through us, and to us. The Old Testament prophet Samuel said, God forbid that I should cease to pray for you. Prayerlessness is a sin against Almighty God. What price do we pay when we fail to pray? Well, we break His command. We walk in disobedience. We rebel against His Word. We grieve His Holy Spirit. We're out of the center of His will. And much more could be said, but enough has been said for you to know that it is right and good for the believer to keep the commandment, pray without ceasing. You've been called to pray. You've been called to pray, and so have I. And there is so much that we could and should pray about that prayer does not need to be a now and then set of circumstances. We need to have a quiet time. We need to pray on a daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes moment by moment situation. We need to set aside a time to be intimate with God and spend in his presence. The study of his word is how we learn his will. Talking to him is how he teaches us how to go about doing his will. Prayer has absolutely nothing to do with you getting what you want. Prayer has everything to do with God instilling in you his purpose and his plan and giving you the desire to be faithful to that. The price of prayerlessness is a rebellion against God, against his teachings, against a refusal to claim his promises, a violation of the very spirit of the scriptures that we should come together and spend time in his presence. But there is a deficiency involved in prayerlessness. You have not because you have asked not. The deficiency is the deficiency of power and of the presence of the Lord and of understanding his purpose and his plan, of walking in his will, of knowing him intimately. As Paul said, that I might know him and the power of of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and the price that you pay and the price that I pay is a deficiency in my life and yours an emptiness a vacuum created when the child of God does not spend time with the father in fact this is such a deficiency that you lack spiritual goods because you have failed to ask for them I've reminded you on a number of occasions that you can have all of God you want. He's available. He's willing. He's able. He can fill you to the fullest, and so can he fill you and you and you and and all of us. And when he has filled us all to the fullest, he is no less a resource than he was when he first begun. For in the Father's presence and by the Father's power and in the Father's pleasing goodwill, he desires that all of us be full of the Holy Spirit. And there's a deficiency in my life. There's an absence in my life. There's something missing in my life when I fail to pray. There's also such a weakness that comes upon us. In fact, there is lost power. Now, know this, that we can... And we do things in the flesh, but we cannot and we do not do those things in the flesh consistently and fervently. 
I'm almost embarrassed to say the following. We've learned how to do church pretty well. We can put a list of songs together and they harmonize and they work and they go from one key to the next as they should. We can teach lessons. We can preach sermons. We can have crowds. We can take up offerings. We've learned how to do church pretty well. But would you please understand that all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down? Would you grasp the fact that all of the church that we do is wasted, not worshipful? Would you get hold of the knowledge that our human instrumentality is not what will change the city and the world and lives that are in desperate need of the gospel? Could it, could it possibly be that we know more than we ought to about doing church and we know less than we ought to about having church? Could that be possible? Could it be that a desperate group of God's people ought to assemble in his house with no agenda but coming into his presence and remaining there in worshipful spirits? Could that be? Well, of course it could be. And the price of prayerlessness, the price we pay when we don't pray is that we rebel against God and walk in disobedience. We're deficient in our lives. We have not because we ask not. And there's a sense of lost power and that we are performing in the flesh what can only be accomplished in the Spirit. Let me share about the place of prayer. And this brings us back to the text and the reason that I chose this text. So here he is. He's in the temple. He's just two or three days away from crucifixion. This is not going to be a good week for Jesus the man. It's going to be a great week for Jesus the God, for he's going to finish the work the Father has sent him to do. But before that, there's going to be travail and agony, pain and suffering, and he's going to die on a wretched cross. But today... He's not thinking of himself. Today, he wants the blind man to see. Today, he wants the lame man to walk, the deaf man to hear. And today, he wants that temple to be such a holy place for his heavenly Father that he's willing in righteous indignation to do what he does. But here's what I want you to get. It's not so much what they were doing in the temple that angered Jesus. It's not so much that they were selling doves and pigeons and even making a living and even swindling people. Wrong, yes, indeed, but it's not so much what they were doing it is what they were not doing that angered Jesus. This is a house of prayer. How dare you treat it like the marketplace? How dare you bring the culture into the church? How dare you act like the world belongs here? What he was so aroused by was the fact that his father's house was a place of healing the hurting and helping the hopeless and ministering to the miserable, not swindling the people. And he cried out and said, this is a place of prayer. And while I wouldn't say about churches today we're somewhat like what happened then. I would indeed say that our churches don't put the emphasis on prayer that prayer needs. I would say that quite often this becomes the place of fellowship. And God help us, sometimes it's the place of entertainment. 
And sometimes it's the place where we socialize. Ought to be the place where in brokenness and desperation we come before the Lord of glory, desperate to have him and not willing to walk away until we do. You've made it a den of thieves. It's a place of prayer. It's coming into contact with the Heavenly Father. It's spending time in His presence. So the purpose of prayer, and you have what I have to say. First and foremost, prayer is worship. I repeat what I said earlier. Prayer is not about you. It's not about you getting what you want. It's certainly not about you telling God what to do. And for all the counterfeit preachers out there in our culture today, it's not about telling God he's obligated to do something because of what you have done. Prayer is discovering what God wants and developing the willingness to do it. Prayer is not getting God to do what you want him to do. Prayer is God getting you to obey his will. Prayer is not about you getting. It's about you giving, your surrender, your sacrifice to the Lord. Prayer is not so much about changing your circumstances to please you. Prayer is about changing you to please God. It's worship. If it's anything less than worship, it's wasted. Because prayer, prayer is just hanging out with the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Prayer is work, and that may very well be why so many of us don't spend as much time in prayer as we ought to. Some of us are spiritually lazy. Some of us are dehydrated when it comes to being filled with the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, when they had prayed, the place where they were was shaken That's how you know if your prayers are touching heaven when God shakes the place where you are. I challenge you to pray aggressively because nothing is impossible with God. Pray fervently because the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous accomplishes a great deal. Pray in harmony and unity because where two or three come together in his name, there he is in their midst. Pray confidently because the great high priest of glory has ascended to the Father and sat down at his right hand and invited us to boldly come to his throne and let our requests be made known. Pray repeatedly for perseverance in prayer is a good thing and necessary. I have known of men, women, who have prayed all of their lives for sons and grandsons, daughters and granddaughters, And some have gone to glory before the answer came. But I was once in a revival meeting where a young man got saved and granny shouted all the way from the back to the front, full speed ahead. Pray persistently. Pray fervently. Pray repeatedly. And for heaven's sake, pray gratefully. We've already been blessed so much more than we deserve. So Pray thankfully and gratefully. Thanksgiving comes once a year in America. It ought to come every day in the church. It ought to come all the time in my life and in your life. You pray thankfully and gratefully. And pray submissively. Why submissively? Because the Father knows all about the circumstance. Because the Father knows much more about the circumstance than you or I do. Because God has a plan and a purpose that will both glorify him and be for our good. So you pray, surrender, and submit before him. Prayer is warfare. This is not a playground. This is a battleground. We're not out for recess. We're in a war. The demons of hell and the angels of God and the spirit of God and the people of God are conflicting and clashing. And if you don't already know that, this culture is after our young people. 
We are but a generation away from people not even wanting or knowing about church if we don't rise up and teach the truth and pray for the souls of our young people. All of these young people scattered out through this sanctuary today, maybe one one hundredth percent of them will be professional ball players or CEOs of large companies. But one hundred percent of them will stand before Jesus Christ accountable for the life that they have lived. With those odds, some daddy ought to say, I'm not getting up until I go up. Some mama ought to say, I'm going to spend more time off my phone, away from my TV, in the book, and asking God to raise up a generation who loves him in spirit and in truth. Some church needs to say, not just Wednesday night, not just Sunday morning, we're going to come by during the week and find a quiet place and kneel and pray and ask God to anoint our ministry so that lives are changed and people can be blessed. This is warfare. The demons of hell hate us. The devil wants to trick us and trap us, hurt us and harm us any way that he possibly could. But Jesus is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and prayer is the key to walking by faith and living out the Christ-like life. So how about it, church? Would you pledge to intensify your prayers this morning? Would you set aside a part of every day? Would you not let a day goes by that you don't cry out in repentance and confession and ask God to do a work in you so that he can do a work through you? How about it, church? Do the kids matter? Are we just going to stand idly by and let the culture capture the kids? Or are we going to break the bonds and the chains by the power of prayer and call the prodigal home? Let's pray. Father, we desperately need your presence. We need your power. We need for your purpose to be plain in us and through us to a lost and dying generation. Would you raise up from this room dozens and dozens of people who will intensify their prayer lives, will spend time daily pouring their hearts out, and asking God to do a miraculous work in the younger generation and in all of us. Would you send revival so that when we turn our face to heaven, you forgive our sin and you heal our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for Worship Online. If this is the first time that you've joined us online, welcome. I want to encourage you to go to our website at www.conwaycentralchurch.org. Here you can find more about our church history, our story, what we believe, see upcoming events, and so much more. If you're in the Conway area, we would love for you to join us in person each Sunday morning and Wednesday evening. Sundays we worship at 11 a.m., and each Wednesday we gather at 6.30 p.m., we have specific ministries for everyone from nursery to college age that meet every Wednesday night. If you want to stay in the know and be better connected to the Central family, you can download our church app from your app store. Just search Conway Central Church. Through our app, you're able to do things like sign up for events, get exclusive digital content, and see what's happening through our handout and other information. It's a great way to stay connected. Thank you so much for worshiping with us here at Central, and we hope to see you again soon.